Marshall Kirkpatrick. I'm the co-editor of the technology blog Read Right Web, and I am honored to get to be here today, <coughs> co-facilitating uh, what should be a really, really interesting panel uh, with some of the smartest people in measurements of social capital influence online. Uh, call it what you will. So, uh, what we're going to do with our, our panel today is start by each very briefly telling you about the coolest things we can possibly think of to tell you about. Uh, we're going to discuss whatever we're uh, each most excited about in our work uh, for roughly five minutes or less, uh, leaving about 20 minutes in our time uh, for discussion with the audience. So, uh, if you haven't yet, start thinking about brilliant questions to ask our brilliant panelists. And uh, I've got, got the note of mutual admiration and support. Uh, I think I will suggest uh, that we we, uh, we begin to introduce ourselves and, and share share what we're excited about. Cool. So I'm going to start. How you guys doing this morning? Right. Pretty sweet. Me too. Uh, <coughs> my name is uh, David Zarell. I work for a company called HubSpot. I call myself a social media scientist, and the reason that I do that. Um, because I go to a lot of social media conferences, I read a lot of blogs about social media, I read love blogs, and I hear a lot of advice that is, for lack of a better word, uh, unicorns and rainbows. Right? So it's a lot of stuff like engage in the conversation and love your followers and love your prospects. And it, it sounds good because I'm not going to get up here and tell you to punch your followers in the face, but it's usually not based on any more substantial than what feels right or what's true to you. So I like to bust you for the rainbow's myths. For instance, this one, and it's some of the most things that I'm most excited about uh, in social media and in, in science um, and talk about influence is busting myths, to be honest. And so here's one myth, I hear this one a lot, um, that quantity, or qua uh, that, that quality rather, quality of followers, is more important than quantity. And so the myth goes, and this is the, the normal viral marketing myth that you hear a lot, is that you can see an idea to a very small number of people, and each one of those people gives it to five people, and each one of those people gives it to five people, and then it, just the whole world has it, right? Like it's like you know the, the black plague, right? Um, the problem is that's not actually true. So using a, a, a processing, or the processing is a visualization library from the MIT Media Lab, and using that, I made something I call tweet maps. Essentially, uh, I took a link that spread on Twitter uh, and visualized how it spread over time. Each circle on this graph represents a user who's tweeted the given link, and the size of the circle represents the number of followers they have, and the, uh, uh, the lines represent connections between them. You'll notice that this shape is the exact opposite of that myth shape. It's an upside down pyramid. Uh, it means that there are ideas that spread and spread and spread entirely for a while, but when you look at you know, sustained spread, sustained reproduction rate of R, which we might talk about a few other times here, it's usually uh, under one, and, and so ideas are only generally only die out. And we see, if I look at something from TechCrunch, the shape is similar, um, and eventually these ideas all die out. Uh, and so, here's another one. If quality was more important than quantity, this would be that myth shape, right? And so it's more important to have quantity of followers to extend the life of an idea because they're going to die out anyways. Another myth that I like to bust is that influence is always about the number of either followers or retweets or whatever you get. This is a couple of months ago, Nelson Mandela quote unquote died on Twitter. He's fine, um, but <laughs> tw Twitter notwithstanding. Um, <clears throat> But the guy who started the idea had less than a thousand followers. He got a BlackBerry Messenger message one morning saying that Nelson Mandela had passed away. He, re he tweeted about it. He got 70 retweets, which even that isn't a ton. But then it trended on Twitter, got mainstream news coverage, um, and, and started a, a big giant rumor. So again, he, he doesn't look like a traditional influencer. Lebo Lukewarm is his name. He, he's just a, a, a guy in South Africa with less than a thousand followers. Another myth about influence is the idea of social proof. While social proof is really important, and I have been a proponent of, you know, use social proof, use social proof. I actually did an experiment in which I split tested two tweet, tweet me buttons on my blog, and I showed half people who came to my site a button that said I had zero tweets on an article, and half people a button that said I had 776 tweets, and I expected to find a 776 tweet button got clicked, clicked on a lot more because of social proof. Turns out I was absolutely wrong. The button that said I had zero clicks, or zero tweets rather, was clicked on uh, to a statistically significant level of confidence more. Another myth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another myth that I busted was, uh, or that I like to bust, is the idea that uh, how many people think asking for a retweet is bad? <coughs> okay. Awesome. How many people think it works? Yeah, my wife's right there. Nice. It does. This is a list of the most retweetable phrases. I hear this a lot. Don't ask for a retweet. You sound hashtag desperate. You know, stuff like that. Uh, 
it turns out it works. You know, uh, I'm sorry, but it does. Um, and then this is my favorite myth to boss. This is just the beginning. Uh, I looked at accounts on Twitter with followers more than a thousand and accounts with less than a thousand. And it turns out those people who have more followers tend to uh, respond less. So they have a few more percentage of their tweets begin with an at sign. Meaning, and then when you look at people with more than a million and less than a million, it's the same thing. Meaning, engage in the conversation might not actually be the best thing to do. Because those users with a lot of followers aren't actually all that conversational. All right, so those are the myths, and we're going to have a whole bunch of questions. Uh, and I'll pass it on to my next panelist. Hi there, I'm Ramya Krishnamurthy, the director of research at Cloud. I call myself a data scientist, someone who's passionate in mining the web and is tracking amazing patterns from them. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about what we think influence is, why does it matter, and how we measure in a quick final introduction, and we will take questions following that. Influence, the what, the why, and the how. What is influence? It is not a popularity contest. It is not about the followers. We believe influence is the ability to drive action. Action. Why do we care about influence? What does it matter? Is influence a big thing? Absolutely. It helps you understand your own success. It helps you understand how, how effectively you are using the social media to communicate across your network. How do you compare against people in the same zone? It lets you understand your network. If you are trying to create content for your network, it lets you understand who are these people in that network? Are they listening to you? Is this the kind of information they're looking for you? Or what are other things you might do that might help them uh, listen to you? And finally, but not the least, to know who to connect to. We are currently living in a world of information explosion. Everything is moving from an offline to close to an online world, meaning information is being produced at such a high rate compared to the rate in which we consume it. If you knew who is that one person and who are those X people who you could listen to and uh, seek information from, then influence helps you in determining that. How do we measure influence at all? Oh. Social actions, they are a big part of uh, measuring influence. So it's all about sharing information. You create a content. Is this information being shared? Are people listening to this information that you share? Is there communication happening between uh, the person who you're sharing the information with? Are you conversing with each other? Do you send each other messages? Are you liking what they do? Are you commenting on their posts that they create? Or you don't, you just read it and like, that's fine, let me move on to the next one. Who are these people and are these actions triggering any event following them? And finally, but not the least, uh, somebody who's trying to list you, if you uh, are creating content, there's always going to be a group of people who are trying to tag you and list you and remember to go back to your content. So these are some actions that sort of indicate influence. Uh, the other important part, what we believe in, uh, is the network effect. So it is just not about the actions, but it, it globally is to a part of who are these people in your network who are driving these actions? Are these people who are more influential than you, less influential than you? Do they like the same content that you are creating, or do, do they hate it? So, uh, you, if you consider yourself as a center in the graph right there, basically the network, the relationship with uh, you share with people surrounding you matters a lot. If you knew who that one person is and how you were communicating with them, that helps you understand the whole uh, dynamics of social. Uh, Okay, so um, for me, I want to talk about a little bit of my, my definition of what influence is. Right? So influence is, as what most people believe, is uh, the ability to change an action, to drive an action, right? But in reality, I would influence you if I change your mind on something, right? So it's really the ability to change your uh, somebody's <laughs> mind and action. Okay, so uh, what does that what does what does that mean like to a, a business, right? So this is actually a very long talk. Um, so, um, but uh, what does that mean? 
So you probably have all seen like the purchase funnel, right? So the purchase funnel is fueled by the mass consumer, right? So anytime you move a consumer down the purchase funnel, you change your mind, right? If I move someone from being unaware of your product to being aware and to be interested to being one of the desired product, I change their mind, I influence them, right? And finally, if I drive an action to purchase, that's also influence too, right? So, so that's in essence what influence is, is the ability to change somebody's mind and action, right? So uh, I'm gonna skip over a lot of things, and uh, here's a thing. So how do we find influencers? So influence, unlike most uh, people believe, is actually a concept involving two parties. Right? It has, to, uh, has the influencer and the target. Uh, both of these parties have to take account. And by looking at a lot of data, so looking at over 10 years of data, um, I find that there's actually six very important factors. So first you have to have credibility. Right? If I'm trying to influence you, right, um, if I have no credibility, you're not gonna listen to me. Right? And also I have to have bandwidth, right? I mean, if I have the credibility, but I don't say anything, I don't tweet, I don't write, I don't blog, I don't do anything, you're not going to find out about anything that I know. So, bandwidth is also important. So, this is uh, what a lot of people out there are focusing on. But remember, this is only one of the factors. Okay. So these are, these are kind of the uh, factors that people call like um, maybe follower or, or how frequent people tweet. So that's all considered as bandwidth. And relevance, right? Without relevance, there's no influence. Right? If you're looking for some advice for buying a camera, um, and I'm an expert in cars, I'm not going to influence you, right? Timing is important too, right? If I, if you're trying to buy a camera right now, and I'm an influencer for a camera that's about a year ago, I'm not going to influence you, right? Channel alignment just means that your influencer, your target, be better be in the same place. Right? If you're trying to run a marketing campaign in New York. It does you no good to find an influencer in LA. If you're trying to influence people in uh, Facebook, it doesn't help you to find a, a Twitter influencer. Okay? Finally, this is the last mile of influence. It's essentially uh, the target has to trust the influencer. Right? This is the confidence factor. Okay, so the thing, the interesting thing about this model is that like any part of this chain is broken, you have no influence, right? If any one of them is broken, you break the chain. Right? You can't influence the target. The influence doesn't propagate your target. Right? So, um, so these are, let me give you an illustrative example. Right? So these are the kind of data that we can use to find a high bandwidth user. Right? So people know about this. They use uh, follower, they use like, you know, um, number of tweets they tweet per day, and all this stuff, and social graph. And to add to that, you also need to have credibility. Right? And the intersection of these two sets is what's so called potential influence. Notice I say the potential influencer, You're not the influencer yet, because I only consider two factors so far, right? Whereas I need really all six, right? So what is the effect of all of these six factors? Let's take a look at like I mean, uh, in in terms of uh, uh, relevance and time, right? So if this was a Facebook graph, right? And say you are a brand, say like Apple, you're trying to find out an influencer for uh, the iPhone four, okay? Who is do you think is an influencer here? Every dot here is a person, and every edge connecting dot is a friendship. Normally, you would say this guy is an influencer, right? Because he has so many friends, right? But on Facebook, you can also like you can track all the conversation, right? It turns out that like you know this guy, he had a lot of friends, but he never talked about iPhone 4. But if I color all the conversations that actually mention iPhone 4, you get this graph. Now, who do you think the influencer is? Probably. And you're a kid, right? Now, I also have the time when these conversations occur, right? So I can plot these red edges <coughs> with a lighter shade of, uh, of red when they're further back in time. Now what happened? Fangirl is an influencer. Well, I should say she was an influencer, but not anymore. She was six months ago. Now her interest has changed. She doesn't talk about the iPhone 4 anymore. Right? So, so this kind of model is essentially you can think of as an intelligent filtering, right? You have to kind of filter out people on the wrong channel, doesn't matter, right? People on the, doesn't talk about the right content, doesn't matter. People who didn't say 
at the time that you want them don't matter, right? And then you don't have the bright bandwidth, and you filter them out one after another, and then eventually you come to a few people, those are essentially influencers. So that's how um, we find influencer lithium. Um, Great. And, and Michael, could, uh, did, did you introduce yourself? Oh, you know, sorry. I must have too many drinks last night. I have six like Long Island last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Michael Wu. I am uh, the principal scientist at Lithium, uh, Lithium Technology, and uh, we are a uh, social customer suite provider, and we activate uh, your customers and turn them into your uh, brand uh, best advocates and influencers. Uh, you're gonna, that's 
a very unusual thing to be able to do. Only, I, I think, one of the 150 people that, uh, that we discovered there had been on Twitter for less than two years. Uh, if you're in that kind of position and you're following uh, 500 people on Twitter and you feel like that's a whole lot, uh, that's where you stand uh, relative to other people in a comparable position um, in terms of the number of, of people they are following. Uh, through that, uh, that same method, I was able to, uh, to identify who the most prolific uh, Twitter users were uh, in the field. Uh, Shashi from Network Solutions uh, is, is one of them. Uh, I got to determine uh, who had been in their, their field the longest by pointing needle base over to LinkedIn and scraping that data. Uh, there was a fellow at IBM who had been at IBM for 19 years uh, who was on the list, and the newest was a, a gentleman who had been hired that morning uh, by a hospital in Cincinnati. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I was able to pull down the, the bio fields in text, put them into Wordle, and see how corporate social strategists uh, identify themselves, and then do uh, location tracking as well. And finally, uh, I was able to pull down the list of people who were being followed uh, by all those 150 social media uh, strategists and determine who showed up in that list most often. Who were the most followed people on Twitter by 150 uh, people running social media strategy? Uh, number one was Jeremiah Bonin himself. Uh, number two was a, a blog that, uh, that you shouldn't read if you have an opportunity to read Regret Web instead. Imaginable. Uh, <laughs> number three was, uh, good luck to them, either a bunch of them or uh, they hired a bunch of my friends, I think, of our time. Uh, number three was Charlotte Lee, and number four was Brian Solis, uh, which made for really good fodder when Altimeter, Charlene Lee, and Jeremiah Williams group hired Brian Solis last week uh, because I knew uh, quantifiably that that meant Altimeter now had all three of the, the most followed people on Twitter uh, amongst 150 uh, social media strategists at corporations. Uh, that's all. I, I would be rude if I said anything more, uh, given that it's already been more than five minutes, but I will say uh, I'm going to go to what I think is a pretty big story uh, this morning. That I believe possibly later today, uh, Google's going to launch a, a new social network effort called Circles uh, that's based on personas uh, where content will be shared uh, just by the appropriate uh, social circles in your lives rather than all of your contacts in a big bucket. That's uh, being led by Chris Messina, uh, who's a, a serial inventor and has changed the world many times before and is now Google. And I think that, uh, that once other factors like that, uh, like uh, context uh, and place and time uh, get involved, then measuring uh, influence is going to become a lot more complicated, uh, a lot more interesting. So, uh, with that, uh, I think I was officially the, the labbiest uh, person on our. I, I apologize. Um, uh, but we've got we've got some time now uh, to discuss. Uh, who has uh, a question, uh, humble or ambitious, that you'd like to start a discussion on? Gentleman right here. Hi, uh, Tristan Zelensky. Um, ben uh, has pointed out that it's quality <coughs> over quantity. Quantity over quality, I'm sorry. And Michael and Ramya, you guys are saying the opposite thing, where you're focusing on the hubs and then they're going to trickle out. So I would like to hear, to, to hear you guys fight over that. <laughs> Where does the truth lie? So uh, I don't think it's quite as cut and dry as we both disagree with each other. Um, I think part of um, what, like what Michael was saying, is that uh, bandwidth um, I think is, is is account for uh, reach essentially, um, and meaning that you're, you're one of the criteria for being an influencer is that you have uh, enough reach to actually influence a large number of people. Yeah. So the thing is that um, the model that I just presented that you. You really need to have all six factor, right? So if you don't, if you don't have to reach, so reach is a necessary, as um, uh, uh, a necessary requirement, but it's by itself is not sufficient. Basically, if you have a lot of, if you not, if you don't have a lot of follower, then you won't be influential. But if you have a lot of follower, that doesn't mean you automatically are influential. Make sense? I agree with uh, Michael on that one. Reach is important, but at the end of the day, you need to create a content which the audience is uh, listening to and engaging to. So, 
volume matters, but it also matters, engagement matters a lot more than that. This is an awesome group of people to answer that question. Uh, having all done so much work on my own. Sir. Hey, uh, Jason here for Team and Geek Dad. Um, one of the things that I find a lot of people seem to be struggling with is the whole issue around trust. How do you know who you can trust when they say something online? And, you know, it used to be there were filters, Walter Cronkite, whatever, who would tell us the news, and now we have so many different sources, it's hard to know who to trust. How do you see trust as a filter shaping up in the future? Do you see a system of trusted filters being created by an organization, or would you see that just evolving naturally out of what we what we have today? Sure. That's a great question. Thank you. Trust is an important factor, but if somebody is influential, it does not immediately imply that he is trustful, but somebody who builds influence over a period of time automatically tends to become trustful because he has built it, maintained it, and sustained over time. So uh, for me, timeliness and uh, the maintenance of influence over a period of time attributes towards <coughs> trust. So I'm actually uh, working on this precise problem. I mean, so one of the things I've discovered is that like, um, what people trust is the people who, the people who you most trust is the people who you have the strongest relationship with. And I'm actually working on something called uh, actually there's an interesting relationship between the strength of relationship and influence, right? Because actually, if you look at it this way, my wife actually influenced me the most. Like she knows exactly what's relevant to me when I need it. She has credibility. She knows my taste. She, all the six factor matches perfectly. You know. So if we have a way to measure the strength of relationship between people, you know, that's already a big step there. So that's I mean, something that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. So um, I, I don't think that uh, this one on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, but it's not on. Oh. Um, so I, I think that. Uh, Trust as a, as a conscious choice is something that's much more uh, focused on by folks in our space, right? Like it's much more social media dorks, and I say that lovingly, um, that are worried about who can I trust. I think mainstream users, it's not such a conscious decision, although I think it is strength of relationship. Um, but like they're going to trust the link if they don't know him. If he says something on Twitter, they're going to believe him. Right? That's what mainstream users are doing. I trust Dan. But right, as a, uh, a pseudo journalist blogger, I trust no one else. <laughs> so, outside of the online world, every expert I know in any other subject doesn't really express most of their expertise online. And in fact, um, most of the, in fact, <coughs> it would be detrimental to how they earn a living to give away a lot of their expertise. So, how does kind of Real world expertise uh, reconcile with this question of influence? You know, I, I sure find that there are a lot more experts and a lot more fields, in my experience, uh, in diverse fields who are engaging online these days. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, there will be more, but it's, it's more accessible, more quantifiable uh, than, than you might think. In my experience, perhaps your experience has been otherwise, but it's, uh, it's a pretty neat opportunity. I would agree uh, that online influence is a great one, but take for example the uh, Google executive who uh, when going on, who used uh, the uh, social network to mobilize people and bring a revolution. So if you can have somebody like that who can uh, use influence in the right way and spread the message across the people to mobilize the revolution and the opportunity to write this, so I think it's direction to Yeah, so I would just like to add one more thing is that like you know um, traditionally, like um, people who had influence are people who publish content, right? Because, but as content are more and more like move toward the digital world, you begin to be track it, right? So traditionally, uh, we measure who's. Uh, I'm an academician. I'm a you know um, coming from academia, so we measure influence by citations on journals, right? But as these publications move online, we got to track who cites most, right? Who gets cited most. So these are things. So. I think this is a, a more of a behavioral change in our culture. You know, like as we move into the online world, then uh, more and more of these kind of traditional form of influence, publication or whatever movie that you make or, or books that you publish, can be measured. 
So at, at the company I work for, HubSpot, we sell a product to a lot of uh, very mainstream and sort of less than sexy audiences. Like we have a golf instructor and a guy who sells chain link fencing and stuff. Um, and they'll ask us very similar questions. They'll say most of my audience isn't online yet, isn't on Twitter. 90% of my audience isn't on Twitter. You know, most of them don't know what Quora even is, right? Um, we did a study, or I did a study a couple of years back, back when Twitter was still very bleeding edge, like when it was only, I actually called them twits back then because I didn't have a good word for a tweeter yet. Um, and again, I say it lovingly. Um, but we found that people who were on the bleeding edge social sites, people who were online in the industry first, tend to reach more people when they talk and tend to talk with people more frequently. So by that definition, that the small segment of people, of influencers and of experts in any given market or any given industry that are online are the most influential because they're online. Hey guys, I'm Tim Sears, I'm a developer for Wagner Instrum, and uh, recently Twitter uh, made it so that they, they started discouraging people from creating Twitter clients from a developer perspective. And as someone who works in the analytics space, you guys are building analytics tools, are you concerned that you might see something similar from the analytics perspective since Twitter has a <coughs> analytics tool now? And I'm just kind of curious on your take on the, de the, the direction from a developer perspective. So Twitter's analytics system is cool. It's not super geeky yet, right? I mean, I'm sure they're going in that direction and it's got some interesting stuff. There's nothing there that isn't available elsewhere. The kind of stuff that I think we were doing, I, I, I would be shocked to see Twitter do it anytime soon. Um, and, and really, I mean, most of like what I'm doing when I do analysis is, is pretty one-off stuff, so I don't feel particularly driven by you know, Twitter's API changes. I would like to add here that uh, Twitter is building it, but given that we are moving from an offline to an online space and everything is moving online, there is eventually going to be one global influence that is going to measure across the web. So we currently measure influence across Twitter, Facebook, and are spanning across to get different networks, and believe that there is somebody who's going to own the space eventually, and we are trying very hard to make that ours. Yeah, that's precisely the, the fifth factor of the channel, right? So um, each you find influencers that are, are on different channels, right? So, and then eventually you'll have to coalesce and work inside them, right? So we've got about 10 minutes left. If we could just have questions from people who have cloud scores that are prime numbers. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> um, so hi, uh, my name's Adrian Marski. I run the Merging and the Social Media Analytics Report in LA. Um, so I want to qualify this question with, uh, I, I like Twitter. But doesn't presenting online influencer scores and online influencer lists suffer from massive selection bias here? Like, we're, we're talking about being able to map those degrees of data in owned networks only and Twitter. So you get to do it because you're lithium, right? And, but if I'm talking about, say, medical influencers, they exist on forums across the internet. And they're actually really important, for instance. And, uh, and I don't have any access to most of that backend data. My ability to map it is extremely poor because everybody built their own forum system. Um, and I, I can't effectively get most of the data necessary to give an accurate understanding of what online influencers are to my clients, right? It, judged by those examples that you gave us, right? Um, which means I, I think you really have to press to talk about online influencers and actually not talk about online influencers at all, talk about channel-specific influencers only. Because we're not giving people online influencers at all. We're giving them Twitter influencers, Lithium influencers, sometimes blog influencers, our ability to map those degrees is very poor, um, and, and that's it. Does that sound good to you guys? <laughs> Well, we're definitely adding more and more channels, right? So we, we have the community as one channel, and we're working on like Twitter, Facebook, and we, as we get more and more channels, we get a better and better picture. Right? But some of this data isn't accessible at all, and never will be for some of these channels. It's just like the problem is too hard. You have to be Google um, to get all the data from all the forums, um, it, or, or even get behind any of the permission laws necessary, right? The, the data is just not accessible. So, like, I, I, I'm totally down with doing, with doing this, but I, I think. The owned versus non-owned influencer conversation is, is not sufficiently well delineated. Yeah, but Google has all the data, right? So you can actually go and, and crawl Google, right? Well, you can only crawl about the first few pages before the results just fall off, but yeah. Um, uh, so we, outside of permission walls, I mean, if you are literally not allowed, Google's not allowed, yeah, you can't get into that data, and that's just, you 
know, the way things go. Um, short of that, when you're talking about situations like where, where bulletin board software is entirely different, it's a hard problem, but it's not an impossible problem, right? I mean, you can write crawlers, you can write scrapers, they grab this data, um, you, you can go through Google, you have to be tricky, it's probably not even allowed, but it's, you know, possible. Not an individual basis, right? Yeah, and I would, once you try to scale up to all medical forms, or even more than a couple hundred, hundred medical forms, sometimes a couple thousand medical forms, you're writing scripts for each one, yeah, I mean, when you get people, it's, it's, a, it's a big, that's a big field, so therefore it's a big problem. I think once you get the top 20%, 30%, you're going to have a pretty good understanding. You're taking a sample of the entire population, right? And there's, there's math to determine how big of a sample you need to take. You don't need to measure the whole population. But it's not random. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. One of the, uh, one of the experiments that I'm just starting to work on is related to the different, and uh, I'm working with a, a distributed computing uh, system to uh, that I can get 300 domains that are top blogs in, in a topic to, and they will go out and index a million URLs that are associated with those domains, uh, and uh, index the text, perform entity extraction through natural language processing, and give me a spreadsheet of, uh, in my first experiment, 1,500 uh, cited experts uh, in that niche topic that bounded the 300 blogs. Uh, with the, their names, their expertise as described in the citation, and the link that they were decided to. I can then go to control F in the spreadsheet to pull out uh, keywords and find people to go and interview about the topics. And, and that's really fun and exciting. To agree, topical influence, I think, is a big deal. And being able to determine who is influential on a topic, just given that once we have this offline world moving on to an online world and then grouping it by topics and having to determine who those people are in the space is going to be a great value. Yeah, so essentially the, the, the notion of topic is, is relevance, right? You want to find information that are relevant to you. You want to find influencers who are relevant to your uh, topic of interest. So that's, uh, yeah, in, in essence, capturing the model. Hi, I'm, I'm Laura Bernalini. I'm with NBC Local Media. I have a question about uh, when you ha are giving, I guess, score-based influence to something, and someone like Kenneth Cole comes up after some of the negative press and then, or Charlie Sheen, how do you use that score to accurately, I guess, tell people whether it's positive influence, negative influence? Like, does influence have, a, I guess, like a trust? If you're using trust as a category, how does something come up? That is a great question. Thank you. Uh, it is quite challenging in the sense to be able to differentiate that. Time again, we've seen sentiment analysis as a very challenging problem. Having said that, uh, if what we try to capture is the ability to drive action. So given that Charlie Sheen was able to capture the market, people were listening to him and forwarding his message, and pretty much he was all over the space, says something. He is a big celebrity, and everybody was listening to him. It comes back to the classic thing of are people listening to him or are they just ignoring his content at the end of the day? So, yeah. uh, it, but I guess, like, how do you, I mean, that's a different kind of influence, I'd say, than someone who is um, influential because, like, he's a, you know, has a press junket right now, so he's, you know, influential right now because maybe not for, I guess, a merit based influence versus, or let's go to the Nicole example where they all have negative press, so. They do something offensive, their cloud score grows. And how do you explain to people that's why the score is raising right now? Sure. It is currently uh, we it is action focused at this time. So given that he is generating this action all around him, whether it's going to be a retweet or a mention or is composing if people does bring him up, but that is a challenging issue and we are working at our end to determine that. Yeah, so I, I would like to have one more thing to that. So the, um, there's two issues, right? One is sentiment, and the other one is context, right? So influence is context specific, and this is, is uh, also dependent on sentiment, right? So essentially, you've seen the graph here. That we could actually tackle this problem by constructing two different type of graph, right? Well, I have a maybe. So you see a, a red graph here of people thinking about good things about, about like, say, Apple iPhone 4, and you have a, another graph, the blue graph. So all the people who have negative conversation about, you know. Uh, Say Apple iPhone 4, right? And then you can compute the influence of those people, those uh, every one of these person with a positive influence or a negative influence, and you can you can tackle that that way. 
And to tackle the, uh, the problem of uh, context is that we actually compute like uh, 11 uh, network metrics, right? These are network metrics. These are not just metrics that depend on each one of these, these, these dots themselves. It depends on the whole network. So it makes it very difficult to gain. So Dan had a, had a thought on that as well, but I, I asked him to, to hold on to that, but he, I'm sure he's got a really interesting response. We're, the, the clock has taken down, and, uh, and we've got a line of people still. Uh, let's see if we can do, if, if you'll forgive me, some rapid fire Q&A for Dan to, to see if we can get through everybody. I'm glad you put that slide back up because that data visualization is beautiful. And Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering, so if your goal is then to influence the influencer that you identify, mm -hmm. right? What your clients are doing with the information, and then how do you understand whether what you are doing as a brand in response to that influencer is actually having any impact? Like if I go give Fangirl an iPhone 4, doesn't that what change her trust score, <coughs> trust score, and then ultimately her influence? So how are brands actually using the influence scores in the way they? Yeah, so that's something you have to be very careful, right? Because by, so it, I put out a little definition about like what influence is. That it influences the ability to change people's mind action, but it We're matters to you. Basically, principles. there's no, no carrot. It means you can't buy them, no stick, you can't force them, no uh, tricks, you can't like trick them into doing something or uh, trick them into taking an action, right? And no annoyance, right? You can't like, uh, uh, Frustrate them, like spam them to, to take some action. So, um, so the, the, the thing that we find that works best for brand is that like is to co-create value. Right? You you so it's, you, you can't since you, you can't work them like an employee. You can't buy them. You can, what can you do with them? Right? You can, so the one thing that we find is to create in an essence a community, right? That can let them uh, let the community carry on the conversation and direct it the the direction of the influence. Basically, let them go the way that they want, rather than what the brand, uh, like, specifically trying to do. Oh, okay. So, I'm
So what it does let you do is, I think it lets you measure uh, it is across the population who we are. It, try, it lets you know how we were trying to use uh, the online space effectively. So if you are a marketer and are trying to sell out a product, then you want to see how you are uh, effectively conversing with others. And sometimes, yes, depending on how the message is spread uh, across the network that you are in this uh, figure one way or over the other way over the score. And, the, the most important thing to remember about algorithms like that, they're all opinion in mathematical form. So you agree with it or you disagree with it. I, I, was, having, I was talking about this with someone the other night, and they were like, oh, because we've never done that before, like with Google, but I think that they're algorithms that we don't really understand. That sounds like a great uh, thing to, to uh, close on, I'm afraid that we're five minutes over our